I don't hear any. I don't hear any music. <laughs> the voice there you go. <laughs> Welcome, my brothers and sisters, to the James Show on seventeen one oh four. The boy. Greetings, my friends, and salutations. Welcome again to the Richard James Show. We're blessed to see another day. We're blessed to be able to express ourselves and communicate things of goodwill. We're going to touch on a topic that we have taught on, talked about before. Uh, I found some wonderful videos of uh, young people who are students at uh, Widener uh, University. Uh, Widener University used to be known, known as Pennsylvania Military College many, many years ago. I uh, have put together a research project on the history of the civil rights movement uh, in the city of Chester. And they come up with some uh, uh, interesting information. Uh, I'm gonna add to that information and I'm gonna, I wanna reach out here on the air to this project to let them know that I am ready, willing, and able to discuss with you the history of the civil rights movement. I'm gonna raise some names of people that you should talk to that are still alive. I'm, I'm 81, so many of those people are elderly, but their minds are clear and, they, and, they, and, and they're still committed uh, things. Uh, I'm going to mention some of those people's names today uh, in in this program, and let let me let me let me backstep a minute and talk about where Chester was uh, in terms in context with the entire civil rights movement that was taking place throughout the country, and many of those uh, leaders of the civil rights movement stand up. Uh, people, fighters, uh, geniuses uh, came to Chester. Uh, Chester, uh, uh, believe me, was more than just a small suburban town outside of Philadelphia. Let me st state some basic things that you should know. Uh, first of all, Chester is the oldest city in Pennsylvania. Chester at one point was uh, on a temporary basis was the capital of the state of Pennsylvania. Chester was settled by the Swedes and then later by William Penn. Chester originally was called Upland. And right now there's an annex of, outside of Chester called Upland, but Chester itself was called Upland at one, at one point. But Chester is a very popular name. If you go to Europe, and particularly in England, you will see Chester's all over the place. The West, and, and here you see Chester, you see West Chester, Child Chester. But this is the city of Chester that we're talking about. Again, we're talking about Chester was the hub of the civil rights movement. Some of the individuals that spent time in Chester, and we'll start at the top. One such person was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And we're going to be doing a show on King. Uh, I think King's anniversary or holiday is around the 15th of January. And we're going to be doing a presentation on King. But King spent a couple of years in Chester. Why? First of all, he was in graduate school. He was in, he, he, he attended Crozier Theological Seminary and received his graduate degree and then went on to Boston University where he acquired his doctor's degree. But he made many friends. He attended Calvary Baptist Church. Calvary Baptist Church uh, pastor was the, was the Reverend J. Pius Barber. Uh, his daughter was a lawyer. And so King studied uh, his ministry under J. Pius Barber. 
Now, let me clarify, Barbara was not the fighter that King was. He was not the man to step out there and, and, and project and fight with King Blood. Jay Pies Barter was linked to the McClure machine. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth, whether you like it or not. He was not a warrior for righteousness. He was not. As a matter of fact, uh, we had to fight to get past him to get some get some things done. That relationship between him and King was very interesting because there had to be some positive things about uh, 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 Barbara. He was the pastor of that church, and he had a following, a very strong following, and he was well known. I mean, his education and and his uh, pre presentation was positive. But when it came to the civil rights movement and trying to gain his support, uh, we did we didn't get it. So we had some issues with power with Big Day Prize Barber. Mega Evans came to Chester prior to his assassination. He preached his eulogy, said that people were trying to assassinate him, and they probably will do that, and they did. But he was a great man, and people didn't uh, really get to know uh, him the way they should have. Mega Evers, Merle Evers, his, his, his wife became the, uh, uh, at one point, I think she was president of the board of directors of, of, uh, of, of, of the NAACP. Mega Evers. Let's move along. Malcolm X, another well-known individual, a, a one person who fought for civil rights, had a national conference that was held uh, in Chester. We helped to put that conference, conference together. Malcolm X is an organization of African-American Union and set up his own independent mosque uh, in Harlem, New York but he had people, uh, tentacles throughout the country, individuals that supported him, supported what he tried, tried to do. So we really, really, really uh, had it going on back in the day. There, these are people who were national leaders and there were others. Bernard Rustin, for example, I, got, I can't mention leaders and individuals who were heavily involved in the civil rights struggle without mentioning uh, Bernard Rustin. Bernard Rustin's home was Westchester, Pennsylvania. And he used to come and work with us quite often uh, in the city of Chester. He was brilliant. He was a man, he really was a man uh, behind the organization for the March on Washington. Uh, he worked with A. Philip uh, or for and with. A. Philip Randolph, who was the head of sleeping car orders back in the day. These are the names that you kids need to check out. A. Philip Randolph. If you don't know who that is, you need to find out. If you don't know Bernard Rustin and who Bernard Rustin, you need to find out. He was a genius. He was an organizer. We had some brilliant individuals that were involved in the civil rights struggle. And, you know, it was more than just a notion. It was more than, than just a joke. It was reality. Understand what's happening, uh, what was happening then back in those days. We're going back over 50 years ago. We're going back to the early 60s. And it was a different situation. First of all, segregation was legal. There was no law that said that you could separate and discriminate against African Americans, with the exception. One thing about it, the state of Pennsylvania had established early before the Civil Rights Act, a Human Relations Commission. Did you hear what I said? There was a man by the name of Norman Watts, I'm giving you some names, who worked for the Human Relations Commission. 
And when we had issues uh, in Chester of discrimination, and we had we had them in abundance. We had a liberal Republican governor, liberal to an extent. He did send the, the uh, troopers in, and the troopers also were just as cruel and brutal as the uh, uh, local local police, and they were both uh, killers. Uh, he also sent in the Human Relations Commission to investigate allegations of police brutality. Because and also to investigate acts of discrimination. You know, we had uh, we had a strictly segregated school system back in those days. We had segregated housing. Much of Chester did benefit, and particularly in World War One and World War Two, from uh, the establishment of public housing throughout the city of Chester. We had a number of them. We had the Village. We had the Annex Project. We had the Bennett Home Project. We had the William Penn Housing Project. We had a number of uh, 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 projects that helped poor people. And some of the things that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, in terms of uh, making available uh, food, in terms of make, uh, establishing social security and other things, helped to benefit the, the poor and benefit us in, in Chester. Uh, but we were heavily, and I, I personally say something to me, to you about me. I personally was involved in the civil rights struggle in Chester. I worked and supported Alfreda Reed, is her name now, it was Alfreda Charlton back in those days. I supported her in the NAACP Youth Council. One of the council members, Liz Williams, was very, very active in that youth council. So Liz has been working for the people of Chester for more years than, <laughs> than I can remember. Uh, we had individuals in Chester who are still in Chester and are still accessible that you need to talk to. And I'm going to tell you, my number is 717-724-7150. And if you want to know the names of many of those, and I'm going to express some of those names today. But I want you to tell you that there, are more, there were more people involved in Chester than just George Raymond. George was extremely important in the movement. But George wasn't the only president of the NAACP. Fred Douglas became president after George. Carl Bond Sr. had been president of the NAACP. There was a vice president of the NAACP by the name of Lewis Brown Sr. He's, he's passed on, but he has a son that's alive. And I'm sure will be willing to be interviewed. There are lots of people that can give you information that you don't have and details that you don't have that you need to have if your pro project is supposed to, supposed to work. Just to give you another little bit of uh, information on me, I also attended Pennsylvania Military College just for a, a semester majoring in international relations. And then I transferred to Cheney, uh, Cheney University, which was Cheney State College at, at, at the time. I've also talked with individuals years ago who had a similar kind of project. I'm hoping uh, you were able to acquire the information that was existed then, because I was interviewed, oh my God, maybe 20, 30 years ago by Widener students who were doing a, a similar kind, kind, kind of project. But if you don't talk about some of these people, and if you don't interview some of these people, you have a lot left out. I'm going to lift up another name before we go to the look at this video. Dr. Felder Rouse. There were not many doctors in Chester. And one of the doctors, uh, Dr. Bayless was another doctor was there, but a doctor who was actively involved in the civil rights struggle. And you cannot talk about civil rights in Chester and not talk about Felder Rice. Felder Rice, uh, after the Stanley Branch 
who was the organizer of the Committee for Freedom Now, uh, slid over to endorse and be a part of the power structure. And that's that's what he did. He, it angered and upset a lot of people. Uh, Felder Rouse organized it, uh, the Chester Civil Rights Committee and continued to continue to struggle. Now, I don't blame people for doing what they do, but it's just sad that uh, uh, such a genius like Stanley Branch uh, would abandon the people that fought for him and were beaten for him and, 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 and went to jail, jail with him in terms of his whole approach. Uh, he became very close to Mary Gorby and they gave him a significant role in the uh, Greater Chester movement. And so, and this really helped our, our, our whole network. But I can't, I can't not withstand the accomplishment. He accomplished some, some great things. I became very close friends with his brother, uh, Glenn Branch, the chief of detectives for Philadelphia County. A uh, wonderful man, glorious man. Now, we're going to start with one video. We're going to listen to it. They'll, they're going to bring up some things and some issues with their lemon and lime. These are young people. They, these are freshmen in college and sophomore. But thank God they have a passion and an interest in, in history. Because if you know where you're from, you know where you're going to. And uh, it's very, very important that we find out where we're from and that and this, and this individual, young people, listen to me, the people that are still alive that you need to interview. They, and some of them still live in Chester and even those that don't are accessible. If you want to get a true picture of what was going on in back, back, back in the day. So now let's see our first, uh, you know, first uh, in, uh, video that would go into the civil rights movement. That's, thank you. All right, hello everyone. Hi, uh, welcome to the Wolf Graham Memorial Library's YouTube page. Uh, today, the library is collaborating with the African and African American Studies program to celebrate Black History Month by diving into how civil rights has shaped the area around Widener University. So lucky for us, we have access to a wonderful collection in our university archives called the George Raymond Papers. And these papers were recently used in a public history course taught by Jordan Smith. Um, so today we are going to be hearing a presentation from this course and we're going to have an open dialogue afterwards. Uh, Jordan, take it away. Thanks, Christina. And I'm gonna keep this really short because uh, the focus really should be on the students who've done the work. Um, but again, I'm Jordan Smith, Assistant Professor of History at Widener. Um, and I'm really happy to introduce uh, Maddie Smith, who's a first year history major, and Manaya Preston, who's a second year anthropology major. Um, they're also both um, kind of African American studies minors as part of kind of the revitalization of that program. So a lot of, kind of great connections. Um, Maddie and Manaya were both in my class in the fall, uh, where uh, they did some really kind of excellent work focusing on kind of protest in uh, the 1960s in Chester. And they'll be continuing that work uh, beyond the end of the semester and then uh, into this summer and beyond. And I'm really excited to kind of work with them. Um, so with that, I'm going to kind of let them, kind of turn, or I'm going to turn it over to them. Um, I'll get out of the way. Um, and uh, I look forward to hearing what they're doing. All right, well, I want to first start off by saying thank you to everyone who's come and is in attendance. Um, I'm not going to try to repeat everything. My name is Maddie Smith. 
Um, once again, I'm a freshman history major and Manaya and I, uh, we met through Professor Smith's class and we kind of hit it off right away and we realized we both had a lot of passion in the same areas, same subjects. Um, and through that, we've kind of built up this research that we're really excited to share with you all. So now Manaya will introduce herself. Hi everyone, thank you guys for being here with us today. Um, again, my name is Manaya yeah. Preston. I'm a sophomore anthropology major with a minor in African American studies. Um, my interest in this research stemmed from my family background. Um, both my mom and my dad are both from Chester as well as the rest of my family. So I really wanted to dig into the city and just explore its history and see what I could find and what I could figure out and share with everyone else. So I'll be presenting um, the museum panel exhibit that we submitted for our final project for Professor Smith's class. Um, so I think um, I am going to need to screen share, uh, Christina. In another, I'm here getting the voice, but I'm just seeing another video. Thank you. All right. All right. So here is the panel for our exhibit. Um, so essentially, before I go into the like the fundamentals of the museum panel, okay. um, I did want to give kind of a brief overview of some of the things we studied throughout our class. So all the students were required to okay. learn a lot about Chester's history. Um, so before going into our specific research on the protests, we wanted to give a kind of historical background. Um, so to start off, in 1917, um, World War I, the U.S. was involved with, and that led to a major economic boost in the economy, especially in Chester. So this happened in a lot of northern cities across um, America, as many of you are probably familiar with. Um, but specifically in Chester, it became very industrialized. And um, other factors led to this, but one of them was the Great Migration. Um, so you had a mass migration of the southern Black population into Chester. And because of this, there were a lot of job opportunities. Um, it was great in terms of like economic impact, but there wasn't adequate housing that was kind of going at a rate that the population was growing at. And because of this, unfortunately, a lot of the Black population in Chester had to deal with very poor quality infrastructure and housing. Um, and those things all combined eventually led to tensions on top of that between the white population and Black population um, because of overpopulation issues and competition in the workforce. Um, so that really was going on for a couple of decades. And this all kind of sprouts up again in the U.S. involvement in World War II in 1941. Um, everything kind of, you see a lot of patterns cross over um, in terms of industrialization and population growth at this time. Um, but a big key difference that we learned throughout class was the issues of suburbanization um, and the white flight out of Chester into the suburbs due to redlining um, or the issues of mortgages and loans being given out to you know white residents and not black residents so therefore a lot of the black residents in chester were still dealing with a lot of infrastructure issues housing issues and on top of this industries in chester started to decline um, leading to more poverty rates um, in the black community so that's kind of a general housing and economic view of where chester was at and how that was leading into the concerns of the black community from what we studied in the 1964 protests. Um, and Manaya is gonna go over um, some of the issues concerning the education that were as a direct result of housing and educational policies. Now we're gonna move into education, as Maddie said. Um, so jobs began to be outsourced to foreign countries, which caused deindustrialization in the city of Chester. With the deindustrialization came a phenomenon called the Great White Flight, which is where white, mass amounts of white residents moved out of Chester and in, into nearby suburbs such as Ridley and Woodland. With the white residents leaving, their tax money left with them, which caused the quality of the schools to deteriorate, to deteriorate significantly in Chester. So now we're going to start to go into the actual um, panel that we created. So we titled our exhibit The Forgotten Protests um, because we believe that the protests were really significant and important for the Chester area. Um, but Chester wasn't as big of a city as like Philadelphia or New York, Chicago. So their protests were kind of, although they were studied, they were, you know, kind of put on the back burner compared to other civil rights movements. Um, and this first introductory statement here 
uh, we kind of went over a lot, but I just want to, you know, um, explain the two main civil rights groups that were kind of um, in charge in the area, I would say, or like very significant. So um, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, uh, that becomes pretty important in Chester. Um, I'll talk about that more later when I discuss um, the sources that we use, but the George Raymond papers that Widener actually has access to and has digitalized, um, he was the president of the Chester chapter of the NAACP, so that's kind of a significant connection to Widener and everything that we're going to be discussing. Um, and the CFFN, which is the Chester Committee for Freedom Now, was founded by Stanley Branch, and he was actually previously associated with the NAACP, but there was a bit of a conflicting um, issue between the NAACP and the CFFN, uh, which we studied in class, and how the Committee for Freedom, or the Chester Committee for Freedom Now, wanted to progress civil rights quickly, and they believed that the NAACP wasn't acting fast enough. So as you'll see in our discussion on protests, a lot of them were headed by the CFFN, um, because they wanted that immediate, you know, equality. Um, and then here, Manaya did work on some of the primary sources, so she's going to go over what this picture is. All right, so to the left is a picture of the Franklin School, which is a elementary school that was previously located in Chester. Um, the school served as ground zero for the fight against de facto segregation, and de facto segregation is, is racism that's not by law but by social norm. Um, parents and community members were extremely upset due to the poor conditions of the school, especially in comparison to the predominantly white schools that were also in the area. They initially took act, um, action against this form of discrimination in 1963, but it gained traction in 1964 during the mass outbreaks of protests. Education and housing issues were extremely closely connected. Housing discrimination kept African American families out of specific school zones, so the families were unable to put their children into better schools because they were forced into neighborhoods that were determined by race. This created a vicious cycle and kept de facto segregation alive. We're going to move into some protest specifics. So in 1963, the NAACP and the CFFN became heavily involved in the fight against de facto segregation. Um, the Chester School Board argued that the housing policies were the reason for the race, for the um, segregation in schools and that it was out of their reach to fix it. Like basically saying that like it's a problem that they can't fix because it's too big, it's too powerful. Um, there were some suggestions made, such as busing students into the school, but the school board argued that that would just be too costly. So on February 11th, 1964, it was an extremely important day. This is the day that the CFFN really kickstarted their series of protests, and it ended up ending on April 22nd, 1964, when the school board just decided to completely shut down. Some important names that we want to keep in mind are Wilbur Johnson, which is a CFFN youth leader, Timothy Tyler, which was a reporter, and we want to pay special close attention to Walter Bryant. He was a student at PMC, which is Pennsylvania Military College, which for those of you who don't know is now Widener University, and he was arrested right in the vicinity. Um, there was an extra push for the, in the fight for racial equality in February of 1964. This is where the protests begin to, train, to gain traction and intensify. April 24th, 1964 was a night plagued by violence, including police brutality. On this night, hundreds of protesters gathered not far from our very own campus, blocking intersections, demanding equality. The protest became so violent that the governor of that time, Governor Scranton, felt the need to call in additional reinforcement. So as Benaya previously did go over briefly, um, this is a picture depicting Walter Bryant, who she already explained was from the Pennsylvania Military College or what we know as Widener now. So just to go into more specific detail on his involvement in the protest. So he was a 21 year old student attending um, the university and he was arrested at the protest and he was actually hospitalized as well due to um, one of the instances of police brutality where he was assaulted and he sustained head injuries. So a lot of these protests were unfortunately um, plagued with a lot of violence, a lot being police uh, battery on civilians, you know, demonstrating their right to protest. Um, and just to kind of articulate this, the Chester youth really did play a significant role in the protest. 
due to the CFFN headed by Stanley Branch. Um, another uh, name we did highlight was Wilbur Johnson, who was a youth leader for the CFFN. And he had instances of police violence, including when they were attacking his mother. Um, he was beaten by police and the news reports show that there were actually police, there was police officers that stayed to continue assaulting him even after like he was arrested. Um, and among all of this violence, uh, journalists and photographers who were just trying to capture what was going on had their cameras um, taken and thrown and a lot of their cameras were broken and injuries were actually sustained to the photographers um, and journalists at the time. So it really was, you know, it became a national issue because a lot of uh, journalists were being assaulted. So that is one of the pictures we did find um, of Walter Bryant. So getting into the aftermath, so I'm going to be discussing kind of some of the legal ramifications and governmental actions that occurred after the protests. So as Manaya stated, uh, Governor William Scranton at the time of Pennsylvania did call in for reinforcement, um, but he wasn't just calling in to give physical aid. He also appointed the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission to lead in investigating all of the civil rights claims that were going on in Chester. Um, so then the, the Human Rights Human Relations Commission, I'm just going to refer to them as the commission, um, they started hearings in Chester and they were actually conducted at the Pennsylvania Military College or otherwise in Widener on May 4th, 1964. So here there was a lot of testimony brought forth of civil rights claims and it, there was a couple of people in attendance that we already discussed like George Raymond and Stanley Branch, headers of the NAACP and CFFN. And after eight days of specific hearings and then a couple of months of more further investigation into the community and a lot of the institutionalized issues, on November 20th of 1964, so a couple months after everything already went down, they made an official statement that the Chester School Board was responsible for the, the, um, for the segregation of the public schools and that it was their responsibility to fix this issue. So prior to this, the Chester School Board kind of relied on the notion that it was out of their hands. It was housing issues, social issues, things that they had no control over to, in order to fix. And um, they even claimed, as Manaya stated, that any of the solutions that were being brought up were too expensive. And just since it's out of their control, it was unfair to put that burden on them. So the commission stating this was extremely important to the Chester community. And it further showed that these protests really were important. Um, and had they not occurred, this uh, commission may not have ever been involved with the claims that were going on in the city to end de facto segregation. So here I have um, a primary source I found. It was from a news article from the Evening Bulletin in Philadelphia on April 28, 1964, after the initial protests were going on. So this news article essentially just shows an outside view of what was going on with the protests in Chester from uh, nearby city Philadelphia. And they were agreeing with um, Scranton's decision to bring in, you know, further aid with the commission to help end the dispute going on. So there was support um, and momentum behind what was going on. You know, the protest really became something that gained and garnered uh, attention. And then here, I also wanted to bring in the other side of what the school board was arguing. So this is actually a manuscript from this Chester School District, and it was their position from 1966 on de facto segregation. So after um, the commission had released their initial claims that the school board was responsible. It actually wasn't something that stopped there. The school board took it up in the courts. There were a lot of appeals um, that went on and lower courts were initially siding with the school district. But the school district argued that the commission had no jurisdiction to actually enforce um, the school board to change anything. Um, but eventually the case reached the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania in 1967. And here they claimed that it was, the, it was the commission was correct in their initial statement and that all these schools that were um, separated were unequal. So what's really important is it highlighted that how the black students were going to schools that were genuinely inferior, both physically and in terms of education than the white students or like the schools with predominantly white population. So this was something at a state level that was, um, it set precedent for future cases. Um, and just from the position paper, I just did want to state that 
here it kind of says the school system did not create the housing pattern. The problem must be met by our churches, our government, and all of our social agencies. All we can do is to mitigate some of the results and whatever we do must not produce more harm than good. So clearly the school board, although this was kind of deemed as um, something that was rendered false in the end, uh, they really genuinely did believe that it wasn't the school board's responsibility to fix this issue and it was just a social issue. I'm going to move into some of the sources we used. I'm going to talk about mine and then Maddie will follow behind me and talk about, discuss hers. So my first one was the Swarthmore College database. And I found this really interesting because our, we entitled our project The Forgotten Protests because we do feel as though it was swept under the rug and wasn't reported on as widely as it should have been. So to see other colleges in our area um, genuinely take an interest so much so that they created their own database at their school um, dedicated to our city and um, the protests that happened in our city, it was like super comforting to see and also made me feel supported throughout the project just to know that someone else is interested. Um, another interesting resource that I took particular interest in was oldchesterpa.com, which is a website and it's filled with um, businesses, people, pictures, addresses who've been a part of Chester community the Chester's community for 50 plus years. Um, residents are able to reflect on old Chester as my parents and grandparents say that they know and still love. Um, they also have a Facebook page that's filled with historical information where people just kind of comment their memories, um, where they used to live, where they used to work, their family connections. And it's really cool to see because these people don't even know what they're doing for us, like the students who are researching this. They don't even know that we're interested. They don't even know that we're watching, but their stories are truly history. And it just makes me so excited that they just share this. So I hope to take those stories and take those comments and make them into something like super huge and super monumental. So Maddie's gonna go ahead and share her sources. Yeah, so um, we did all utilize like similar sources, um, but in terms of our research, it was kind of different since we took on different stages of the research. Um, a lot of mine had to do with the aftermath. So I did utilize a lot of the Human Relations Commission's specific research, any NAACP paperwork I could find online. A lot of what I went over were legal proceedings and cases um, of at, like the aftermath of what was going on. Um, and including in all of this, a lot of the help that we got in researching um, the specifics of the protests were from the Delaware County Historical Archives. It was very, they made, the system they use makes it very easy to research Chester um, and like highlight certain names that were found. So a lot of the information we found was also from there. Um, but most importantly, there were two main sources that we really wanted to highlight and give our gratitude to. So first being the George Raymond papers. Um, George Raymond's family actually uh, allowed Widener to maintain and then digitalize the scrapbooks that he had collected through being president of the Chester NAACP. So a lot of the information we got were specifically from there, and I'm not sure it would have been as easy to find them had his, you know, his family not been as gracious enough to um, allow the Widener students to utilize those uh, papers. And also um, we wanted to give almost a shout out to Christopher Mele because he was an author who researched a lot of the issues going on in Chester. He was actually a guest speaker in our class and he wrote uh, Race and the Politics of Deception. And um, we all studied this book in class, but I know for me and for Manaya, we definitely always found ourselves coming back to the book because the way it laid out the history of Chester and the specifics of even the NAACP and CFFN relations it was just very well done and we wanted to really highlight how much it helped us in our presentation and our research. So Maddie, for this section, feel free to unmute and jump in at any time. So we're super excited to announce that we're continuing this research in the summer of 2021. We are beyond excited. Um, and I know Maddie can attest to that too. Like this is all we talk about. So basically we hope, to shed, we hope to shed light on Chester's past while connecting it to its present and ultimately improving its future. Um, one of our big goals is bridging the obvious and painful gap between the wider community and the rest of the city of Chester. One of my personal main goals is to make everyone understand that Chester is the way that it is today. Because, like I want people to understand that it's not that way. It's not its own fault. Like I want people to understand that there was discrimination, there was racism, there were there was hatred, there was redlining, all different sorts of systematic things and, and 
that put Chester in the situation that it is today. And I think that's a really important for us as Widener students and Widener community members to understand. Um, and we also are interested to know the role of Widener and we're, we're going to highlight, like, I'm sorry, <laughs> we want to know more about Widener's role in the history of Chester and were we on the right side is the big question, even going back to our PMC days. Um, we plan on developing an app that takes users on an interactive tour around Widener in the surrounding area, displaying important landmarks around with the, along with the rich history each of them holds. So Maddie's going to talk a little bit about her goals and about the project and what she hopes to gain from it. Uh, yeah, thank you, Anaya. So. Um, I have to agree a lot of, um, of what we were working on. It was just due to like personal passions, I think, passions, I think. Um, so with the research that we're conducting, although it's specifically for Chester, I know for me, um, I don't have like this, the background with family members living in Chester, residing in Chester. Um, I only really visited Chester when I started um, going to Widener University. Um, but I do live, I live in New Jersey, um, not far from Chester. I live in Salem City. Um, and a lot of the issues that I've seen in terms of deindustrialization, um, in terms of like infrastructure, um, economic issues, I see a lot of that parallel in my city. And I know a lot of these issues are is something that goes on around cities across America. Um, and to be able to look at somewhere so close to home and so similar to home, it it really like connects to you and like your experiences and your role in something. Um, and helping me understand because I can't understand the issues of the black community in a way of personal experience, but looking at what went on that was controlled, you know, the politics that went into things, um, the policies that went into things, the way that the courts ruled. Um, and for me, when I eventually go to law school, I want to look at that and study that and see if there are resolutions. And without this fundamental knowledge, especially for our community, I don't know how you could solve issues without understanding why the issues are there to begin with. Um, so that's kind of how we both are looking at it. And we, I know Manaya has offered me so much insight on things I would have never understood had I not been working with someone who has so much um, like experience in the community itself and family members in the community. So that's kind of what we're looking at for our research. Um, but I know we were gonna open it up to questions um, or any comments or anything like that in discussion. Yes, and may I be the first to congratulate you on an excellent, excellent presentation. I am absolutely impressed, 100%. So thank you so much for sharing that with us today. Um, we do have one question already uh, in the comments, and that is to please go over the websites that you guys were mentioning when you talked about the different um, public resources that were available. And the chat is now open. You can start sending in questions and I'll be asking them. Okay, if you guys give me like 10 seconds, I'm going to pull up the um, both of the websites that I referenced. One second. Um, well, I can start off. Um, Widener itself, we utilize the library archives. I'm not sure exactly what it's referred to. I can pull it up now. Um, I know we, we went through Widener's um, archives. Like it's like the digital Wolfgram library mm -hmm. on under Widener. And they have like the collection of the George Raymond papers. And it's all cataloged really great. Um, everything is easy to look at. Um, so one of those things that we looked at in terms of like news scraps, articles, things like that, we went through there. And I know for, I utilize a lot of the Delaware County Historical Archives is what it's called. And it's just like an online database of like the Delaware County, I think the Delaware County um, Daily Times was one of them. And if you see here with my Walter Bryan presentation, um, that was one of the archives that I used for my research. And you are still sharing your screen. Um, so if you want to end that, you can, or if you want to keep sharing okay, it, you yeah. can. Either way. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Okay. <laughs> All um, right. If I can share it for you now. Please do, yes. Okay, I can. It says host disabled. I thought I had made you a co-host. I apologize. You should be good now. Um, yes, okay. So, 
This is the first website I discussed, so it's just www.oldchesterpa.com. We're not um, seeing it just, yet. I'm sorry. No, you're not. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me try again. Hold on. That's okay. There we go. Are we there? Yes. Okay, perfect. So this is the first website I discussed, which, I, like I said, is just www.oldchesterpa.com. So you can scroll through um, so many businesses, biographies, businesses, cemeteries, like really any thing you can think of. Um, it does have some pictures, like I discussed, where people just can kind of come back and reminisce on the old Chester that they know and love. So it's super cool. Chester High, which I know a lot of my family went through here. So I encourage everyone watching to go like um, explore and bop around this website because it has so much information and I found it so interesting just to see. And the second one, this is the um, Swarthmore database that I was discussing. So again, it just has some information about the, um, as you can see here, it says like 1963, 1963, just some information about the protests that we were discussing. And like I said, it was so awesome to see that we're sharing this interest with fellow um, college students and colleges and other universities in our area. I'm just excited that other people are taking an interest in it. So I'd also encourage you guys to go check out this website if you have some time. Yeah, and I can um, share my screen again I did pull up the websites I utilize as well so this is through Widener specifically the University Archive Digital Collections so this is what the George Raven papers look like and if you go further into this and browse everything's cataloged according to date I think and then you can go in further and anyone can access this I believe it is um, open. through Widener mm -hmm. it is open. Um, and it's awesome like a lot of these things like you can go through everything is like <laughs> if you look here very systematically done. Um, and then another thing we use, I brought up Walter Bryant here, but this is for um, the Delaware County Archives. And if you see here, they'll highlight the name that you looked up, and then you can look through the actual newspapers that they archive digitally, um, which is where we obtained this picture from. Um, so yeah, those are the things that I think were really important that we use. Awesome. Okay, I do have some other questions. Uh, one from Jen Wise is, uh, when you all were doing your research, what was something that surprised or inspired you? Um, something that we didn't really go too far into detail with in our presentation, but I know we discussed a lot in class, where the machine politics that went on. Um, so we discussed a lot about the McClure machine. Um, I know another group that was presenting in our class, one of the um, group members, Liam Thompson, he went into a lot of detailed discussion on that. And I remember not recognizing um, until the class how much, you know, politics had a role in things and how one person who had political control could really affect a lot of areas in like in people's lives in Chester. Um, and I know when I was researching George Raymond, uh, we had oral interviews that we got to have access to, which was really awesome being able to hear these people talk themselves and answer questions. So George Raymond, he discussed the machine politics and to hear it from someone who was living in that moment. And it was just extremely surprising. And like that's something with our future research, we hope like we can uncover more of, especially with it relating to Widener since the McClure Mansion is like literally right around the Widener's campus. Something that inspired me, Maddie kind of just mentioned this, we were able to listen to um, Chester residents and there were two in particular that sat with me. Um, one was, forgive me, I forgot her name, but she was the granddaughter of George Raymond and one was Miss T, which was a, um, I believe, English teacher at Chester High. Uh, so just hearing their stories and hearing their incitement, excitement and sharing their stories with us, um, I could see the genuine joy on their face that like us as Widener students were interested and looking into their stories and interested and willing to listen to their stories. So that kind of gave me fuel to just keep going. There are people out here who um, see us, they hear us, they support us, and they want us to keep going. So Maddie and I have already discussed, we're kind, we're doing this for ourselves, but we're also doing this for multiple communities, such as the Chester community and the wider community, because we just want to bridge the gap. That's our big goal is bridging the gap. The first person Maniah was mentioning is Donna Mims, who's actually herself a, a Widener alum as well. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so cool. Um, another question from Rebecca Wise is, how long did it take you both to complete this fabulous presentation that you shared with all of us today? 
It was pretty much um, a, so, a semester long um, project. Um, when Professor Jordan um, introduced it to us, Maddie and I literally right away we started. Um, I can't speak for everyone else in the class, but I know like, oh my gosh, me and Maddie were just like, yes, let's do this. So we were really excited. We jumped right into it. And Saturdays, Fridays, 2 a.m., it was history. It was Professor Jordan's class. So this was a pretty long process and we plan to continue and continue like grinding this out together because we find so much joy in sharing this with you guys and making these presentations for you guys and sharing everything we find, so. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, we actually, it's kind of scary. Um, we have like a Google document of all the information that we ended up like annotating, taking notes on and it's like, extensive and almost embarrassing um, how much we worked on it um but our biggest issue with the class wasn't getting the material it was like winding all of that down into something that we could have in like a cohesive quick quick presentation um so that i would say if there is a question about that that was definitely our biggest um obstacle throughout the research I am double checking just to make sure I think we've gotten to all of the questions that have been asked so far. Uh, we do have a few more minutes if other people would like to add questions, but the chat is just overwhelmingly thankful and appreciative of all of that you guys have done. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you for being willing to come into this crazy live stream. <laughs> And, uh, and throw a little bit of attention over to the university archives. I know they love that. Um, so one thing, just for a second, I'll uh, interject. And so first of all, I wanna say that this presentation was, was fabulous. I think um, those of professors kind of in the crowd can would probably agree in saying that I've been at many academic conferences where the quality of presentation was not that high. Um, but I wanna, um, you know, whenever we do these sorts of events, I think there's a certain amount of us advertising uh, and kind of shamelessly plugging that goes into things. Um, so one thing I just wanted to kind of mention was that this is kind of an ongoing project um, that uh, will kind of have different, will take different forms in the next several years. Um, we've got people working on it this summer. There will be kind of future classes. Um, kind of uniting the different parts of this is something that I think Manaya did a really good job of kind of explaining um, where we're taking kind of the traditional sources that we think of when we think of histor historians, like dusty legal documents and other things like that. Um, and we're combining things that are kind of created by the recollections of people who live these events, whether that's these oral histories, whether that's kind of websites that, that don't necessarily look like what we would norm what historians often use. And together, we're trying to kind of bridge those documents, think about kind of uh, history and memory, and create a community accessible history of kind of 20th century justice. And so part of that is um, a, hopefully a traveling museum exhibit that you all saw kind of an example of, of, kind of what one of the groups did. Obviously, we'll continue kind of building on that. Um, another one is this kind of augmented reality phone app. Uh, that we're kind of working on this summer and I'm sure it'll take other forms as well. Um, so Maddie and Manaya have really kind of uh, taken the bull by the horns here uh, and that's great but there's absolutely room for other kind of people who are interested to kind of get involved in the project in different ways. Um, my strongest recommendation would be to reach out to Maddie and Manaya. Um, they can give you a sense of kind of what they're working on um, but you can also kind of reach out to me um, you know, I think we have a fair amount of momentum right now and we want to, we want to keep that, uh, the ball rolling. So, just, so I'm going to stop talking now, but again, I wanted to kind of uh, express my appreciation um, and also kind of put that plug in. We do have one last question. It is from Cheryl Streety and she says, she asks, did the protests that you spoke about have connections with other protests in surrounding areas? Um, well, I think one of the things that we researched was in Delaware, there were also protests going on um, and we researched it through class and a lot of these protests were going on at the same time. So they were all kind of linked, especially due to like the NAACP's involvement. Um, but this Chester, it was unique because of the CFFN, the Chester Committee for Freedom Now. So a lot of what was going on was, I think, unique to Chester in terms of what we researched from the protests. 
Um, but there are definitely overlaps throughout like cities across the country at the same time. And she adds, was it similar to the way that sit-ins were organized in Southern universities and cities? I actually went to the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and Greensboro, North Carolina was one of the locations where many sit-ins were organized and there were some really powerful leaders who were able to connect those people together. Um, do you guys have an example of that happening around here? And it's okay um, well, if the I, answer is we're not sure. That's completely okay. <laughs> a lot of protests that went on, we highlighted, you know, like a certain event that was kind of um, like, it wasn't just a catalyst. It was kind of like the tip of the iceberg situation because of the intervention through um, Governor Scranton. But prior to that, there were sit-ins that were going on um, facilitated by the CFFN. Um, and I know I came across that in my research. Um, and you even can see um, overlap of certain people. Like I'm pretty sure Walter Bryant was even involved in one of the sit-ins and arrested prior to that. So, um, you know, it wasn't something that was just like one, a couple of nights events. It was something that was going on for months. Yeah, I do think that the events can definitely be connected to other events that were going on nationally. Um, like I mentioned, in February of 1964, there was an uptick. And when I talked about the uptick in civil rights movements, it was everywhere. It wasn't just in Chester. And we do have multiple prominent figures um, of the NAACP and the CFFN who kind of jump started this and um, wanted better for themselves, wanted better for their community. So yes, there were um, figureheads that pushed push the movement similar to other cities. So I think it was almost like a ripple effect through the nation. And we're thankful for that. All right. <laughs> and we're, we're, Deja says hello. All right, we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna end the video right, right, right now. Um, uh, I uh, applaud the young uh, students uh, for this project. I'm interested and I'm gonna reach out and touch them because there's a lot of things that they really, really don't know and they couldn't know. Um, so, uh, when, when you talk about uh, this, this effect, or was it connected to other demonstrations? Well, the Committee for Freedom Now uh, was very active, not only in Chester, but they also marched with Cecil B. Moore uh, at Gerard College. There were Chesterites that were there uh, uh, supporting Cecil B. Moore, and Cecil B. Moore came to Chester uh, and had his folks demonstrating with the people in Chester. So there was a real strong connection between Philadelphia, you know, and and and, and, and Chester. Uh, we also were very, very well connected with Malcolm X, as I told you earlier, and they don't seem to have any knowledge of it. We had a national conference here in the city of Chester uh, uh, at the Prince Hall Lodge. I think that's located on Third Street, and which this was a Malcolm X organization, organization of Afro-American unity. Malcolm was there. Many noted uh, figures and civil rights attended that conference all over the, all over the country, including Gloria Richardson, who was head of the uh, 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 project in, in Chambers, Maryland, that, that, that marched with us. It, uh, so yes, the tentacles were out. Yes, there were connections. We had Martin Luther King, the national head of the entire movement spent two years in Chester that was connected and supported us. So kids uh, and their people uh, that exist and that are still alive today, and, and some of them have, have uh, uh, written papers uh, and information that you should share. And let me say this to you. The press was no real friend of the movement. Yes, the idea that publicity went out and some of the images that were uh, that were created with the brutality did help us. But if you read some of the things, it was very negative and very supportive of authorities. We had peaceful demonstrations, but if you had read it uh, and in some of these newspapers, you would think there were riots. They termed it riots. So no. Uh, they were ne not necessarily our friends. Let me just throw out a few names that you want to check out. First of all, there's an Eric Jackson. Eric Jackson uh, had family members that were very heavily involved in the movement. A gentleman by the name of Tom Jackson, for example, was involved. There's 
uh, Alfreda Reed and James Theodore Reed. Uh, James Theodore Reed created the Chester Repertoire Theater. And that depicted many of the issues and things that were going on at the, at the day in, in terms of the arts. Brilliant man. And his wife is Alfreda Reed, who led the first demonstrations in Chester. Where have you, you talked about Wilbur Johnson, who was a very close friend of mine and very active and very involved. But the person that got Wilbur and myself involved was Alfreda Reed. And she headed up the NAACP Youth Council. Lots you need to know. There was another organization called the Young Adult Council of the NAACP. I was involved. Uh, Lewis Brown was involved. Uh, Fred Brooks. There were many individuals that were involved in this movement. But try to get a hold of Eric Jackson. Eric Jackson also himself has his own information. And some of these people have kept figuring. And he is, he's one of the younger brothers. He was himself very, very young at that time, but he had other family members. His mother, for example, I understand, participated in some of the uh, in some of the marches. But I know and his older brother Tom was a very active a member. Things that you should know. There was a woman named Ruth Cephas. Ruth Cephas was the key organizer for the Committee for Freedom Now. See, the Committee of Freedom Now, know how it was structured. It was a community-based organization. And we went throughout uh, Chester and we organized Black organizations. So it wasn't just one central group, but we had uh, Black organizations that we put together. My training was community organization. And I participated in the organizing of the Committee for Freedom Now. So there was a lot going on. Uh, we didn't get on, it's, it's a topic that we could go on and really get more involved in. But Wilbur Johnson, let me say that, is still alive. You should contact, and he has a brother, William Johnson, call him Billy. Wilbur is still alive. You need to talk to him. Wilbur Johnson's mother, who you spoke of, but that was beaten by the police, is still alive. She's in her 90s. I think she's around 90, 96, 97, 97 years old. Contact, uh, contact William Johnson so that you can get turn interview. You need to interview Wilbur Johnson. One of the leaders of the movement is still with us on the planet Earth. There are others that were that were in part of it, uh, other individuals uh, that were that, that are there. And I'm not sure whether they're living in jail because I haven't been in touch with these in a long time. But I just wanted to say that this is an interesting type topic. I think I'm going to have to do it again because there's so much information to go to, uh, to, to uh, develop and, and to present. Uh, thank you for tuning tuning in to the Richard James Show. This is our just like to throw out the fact that we're still down in Lebanon Farmers Market, at 35 uh, South Eighth Street. We're still selling selling African clothing and African garments, uh, giraffes, drums, oils, uh, Afri African clothing, and we appreciate your support. Uh, we're trying to do some good. We also we don't just sell things; we educate people. Uh, about the history of the civil rights movement and the history of, of, of the struggle. Uh, so thank God for you. Thank God for, for the Thomases for continuing with the voice. Support the stations, uh, folks. There's a lot of things going on, and a lot of information, data information coming up, not just the Richard James show, but other shows that uh, and presentations that you need to take a look at. So I'm going to say to you so long, and may heaven smile upon you and be gracious unto you, unto me. Thank you again, and I'll see you next week. The Richard James Show, signing off. Take care. <laughs>
checking out the time. So listen, let's hear from you sometime also. So this is your neighbor and your friend signing off. Until I see you again next week and hear from you again next week. So long. God bless.